Hard 14-hour workdays, walks of more than 20 kilometers without shelter in the cold Soviet winter, crowded wooden barracks, and communist indoctrination classes. These were some of the calamities experienced by German and Japanese soldiers in World War II when prisoners fell into the clutches of the Soviet Union. Throughout the conflict, it is estimated that the Red Army managed to capture around 5 million war prisoners from the Axis countries, most of them Germans and Japanese. Their living conditions were extreme and the government of the Soviet Union did everything possible to take advantage of the manpower obtained, to the point that these were essential for the Soviet country to come out of World War II as a world superpower. But, what was life like for prisoners of war in the Soviet Union? Don't leave your screen, because in the next few minutes we'll review everything that happened to the German and Japanese soldiers held captive in the USSR. Are you ready? Let's get started. The vast majority of the Soviet Union's prisoners of war were detained in the last years of the war. German soldiers began to be captured earlier as a result of the German invasion of the USSR that began with Operation Barbarossa. However, the number of prisoners grew exponentially after the momentous Battle of Stalingrad. The Japanese, on the other hand, were mostly imprisoned during the Red Army's invasions of Manchuria, the Kuril Islands, Sakhalin Island, and Korea. These were generally held in labor camps in Siberia and the Soviet Far East, while German prisoners were placed in the European USSR. Both Japanese and German soldiers were aware that Soviet captivity was the harshest and most extreme within the Allied forces, largely because they were not particularly interested in complying with the Geneva Conventions regarding the treatment of prisoners of war. Stalin saw a great opportunity in using this vast number of men as free and easily exploitable labor, so he built a huge captive system that included 24 border camps, 72 transit camps, 214 hospitals for enemy soldiers, 421 battalions of labor and more than 500 labor camps. Japanese prisoners were mainly used to build infrastructure. According to calculations, 26% of all Japanese prisoners were destined for work in forest industries, 23.5% for mining, 12.2% for agricultural work and 16% for heavy industry and construction projects. The remaining captives were changing between different types of work or were too injured or weakened to do any kind of activity. The prisoners of the Japanese Empire were instrumental in modernizing the underdeveloped Asian part of the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the Germans captured on the Eastern European Front had as their first task to rebuild what they themselves had destroyed, especially Stalingrad, which had been completely destroyed after the battle. Later, they were used to build public infrastructure, including everything from housing to airports. However, the Germans were not simply destined to build, but were also used by the Soviets to strengthen their military industry in the context of a war that was not yet over. Since many of the Soviet men and workers were in the fight, the prisoner labor was more than helpful. It is estimated that, over the last years of the war, 30% of the men who worked in the Soviet aviation were actually Germans, the same for the metallurgical industry that had a 20% German workforce. The Soviet Union even took advantage of the knowledge of some German prisoners, forcing captured scientists to work on nuclear rockets and ballistic missiles for Stalin's government. Regardless of the forced labor, the living conditions of the Axis prisoners were far from good. Most were forced to work between 10 and 14 hours a day, despite the fact that the legal limit for prisoners of war was 8 hours. Simultaneously, beyond the well-oiled Soviet captivity system, mobilizing and maintaining so many people was extremely complex, even more so when most of the resources were sent to the battlefront. As a result, captured Germans and Japanese often lived cramped in small barracks in the camps and were forced to march up to 20 kilometers to work. At the same time, they were not equipped to face the harsh Soviet winter, so cases of hypothermia and other illnesses were very common. Beyond all this, one of the most surprising and impressive facts is that the Soviets made the effort to indoctrinate their prisoners. Through pro-Soviet literature programs and classes, they tried to detach Germans from their fascist doctrine so that they would embrace communism. 
This indoctrination attempt was not particularly successful. While many prisoners took the classes, most did so to get better treatment and food, reducing their hours of forced labor at least a little. Even if someone did very well and managed to convince the Soviets, they were sent to Moscow or another big city to continue their re-education, before returning to the field as an instructor of communism, a position much better than that of a simple captive. After the end of World War II, the long and complex process of repatriation of prisoners began. The Soviet Union first sent the weak and sick to their respective countries, since they represented a greater expense and were not fit to work. Slowly, over the next few years, all the surviving POWs managed to return to their homelands. The number of casualties is difficult to calculate. Among the German soldiers held by the Red Army, Soviet sources report that 350,000 out of a total of 2.4 million prisoners died, or 15%. On the contrary, German sources maintained that 3.5 million were captured by the Soviets and that 1.3 million died in those years, which would represent a high 37%. As for the Japanese soldiers, it is even more difficult to know, since Japan never presented official information about it. According to Soviet numbers, in a total of between 560 and 760,000 detainees, between 60 and 300,000 died. Undoubtedly, the life of the prisoners of the Soviet Union was hard and demanding, struggling against forced labor, cold and poor living conditions. Despite these factors, they played a prominent, albeit forgotten, role in the reconstruction and improvement of a USSR that would emerge from the terrible war as a world power. We have reached the end of the video and we want to ask you, which country do you think had the worst treatment of its prisoners during World War II? Leave us your answer in the comment box below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history. Thank you very much for joining us until the end. And stay tuned for our next video.